All right. Good morning, Grace Life Church. <clears throat> I hope you're doing well. We're doing well. We're uh, enjoying family time and uh, lots and lots of family time. Yes. <laughs> Making up for lost time. But uh, good to be here with you today. Let's start with a hymn. Verses in that song says, "Here I raise my Ebenezer." And uh, good morning, good morning, Tori. Um, it says, "Here I raise my Ebenezer; hither by Thy help I come." That's not referencing uh, Ebenezer Scrooge from the Christmas Carol. That's referencing an altar that was built by the prophet Samuel, uh, the last judge of Israel. Um, and he built an altar, and, and the term Ebenezer literally means God has been faithful so far. And so with this song, we build an Ebenezer, and we say, look, God, God has been good to us thus far. How can we not assume as we move forward that he will be with us and give us all things? He is faithful. So if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, we are going to continue our study on the book of Philippians today. Hey, Mom. Hey, Denise. Welcome. Good morning. We're going to be in Philippians 1, verses 18 through 26 today as we continue our study on this prison epistle written by Paul the Apostle. I'm reading out of the ESV. Philippians 1, 18. I'm going to read to verse 26. Paul writes, What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, Yes, in that I rejoice. So that's actually um, a verse that Caleb talked about uh, last week. Um, and so I'm, I'm taking the second half of verse 18 
uh, through the end of this text here in verse 26. Paul writes, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For, I am to, for if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that uh, what we need to know, that you would teach us where we need to go and where our hearts need to go, that you would take us and lead us. We look to your grace and not our human merit or intuition or ability. We look to your spirit's ability and ask for your grace on this time in your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, first of all, this whole text begins by Paul saying, I will rejoice. And I actually referenced on Sunday uh, something that was pointed out by Sinclair Ferguson in a teaching that my family and I have been listening to around the dinner table from Romans chapter 5, where it says, I rejoice uh, in the gospel. And what's interesting about that is it's actually the same word used in a negative way in other texts where Paul speaks against boasting in human righteousness. Um, for example, Ephesians 2.9, that our salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. But this word rejoice is actually the same uh, word. It's the same idea uh, that the apostle uses in the positive. So where, and it's a contrast. So in one way, we used to boast in our righteousness. We used to boast in our merit, in our, in our human goodness. Paul is saying that, that kind of boasting is bad. But here's a good boast. We boast now in the Lord. I rejoice, he said. And so this is the good boast, uh, that we rejoice in our salvation. We rejoice in the Lord Jesus. And then he says, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, it will, this will turn out for my deliverance. And Paul must have had a prophetic intuition that he was going to get out of prison because this is a prison epistle, the uh, book of Philippians, and it was actually written in his first of two imprisonments, and he did get out and had more fruitful ministry among the Gentiles uh, for uh, some time, and then he was put in prison again that eventually led to his execution. And so he says it was, it was joining together with the prayers of God's people that he was delivered. And then he gets into this whole text about... Uh, living, you know, to serve people with the gospel or dying is gain to be with Christ. And I want to talk about that for the rest of our conversation this morning. And there's two things that I want to look at here. Number one, that Paul's highest treasure was Christ. And number two, that Paul wanted the church to know the joy that he had. So let's look at each one of these. Paul's highest treasure was Christ. The world and all its treasures looked pale in comparison to Christ in Paul's eyes. Nothing compared to knowing Jesus Christ. And Paul says it plainly later on in chapter 3 of this same book when he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And so he's saying, I found something extremely valuable, something that has uh, worth that is superior to anything else in this world. And he says it's knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And it reminds me of the hypothetical question that Jesus actually asked when he said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So Jesus sets, if you will, two treasures in the balance in his question and he ultimately shows that there's no comparison. He says, what's greater? Uh, 
all the gain that you might have in this world or your soul? And to Jesus, it was a hypothetical question with an obvious answer that our souls are of infinite uh, importance and the state of our souls is of infinite importance and therefore salvation is the pearl of great price. Knowing Jesus Christ, knowing God. And Paul found this pearl of great price. Nothing compared to knowing the Lord Jesus. And this, this passion he had for knowing Christ this affection he had, this, this at times intoxication he had with knowing Christ, um, at times created unusual musings that probably most people would look at and go, what is wrong with this guy? Is he mentally ill? For example, in verses 21 through 23, he says, if I'm, the li if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. He's actually like, Musing like, what, what, what do I want? Do I want to die? Hmm. That's not bad, he says. Because I get to be with the Lord. I get to see him face to face. He says, I'm hard pressed between the two. Not that it was actually up to him, but he's, he's thinking about this. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. He says, that's far better, he says in the text. And so it created this bizarre reflection. In a sense, he's saying, dying actually looks attractive to me, but not as an escape from this world's pain, you know, like a suicidal, a person with suicidal thoughts would, would have or might think. But he's saying, because Jesus Christ looks so glorious. And in a sense, he's saying, I can't lose. If I live, I get to preach the gospel that has given me so much joy. If I die, I get to see Christ face to face. It actually reminds me of a story from the life of Corey Ten Boom, and I know a lot of you know her and her life story. Uh, she's been a huge inspiration to me. I remember, if my mother is still watching this, I remember my mother gave me a tape when I was like 12 or 13 years old, and it was Corey Ten Boom sharing her testimony, and I put it in my tape recorder, and I remember hearing the sss, you know, that hiss that you used to hear of the ground floor noise of a tape. And then Corey Ten Boom's, you know, Corey Ten Boom with her Holland accent, you know, talking about uh, forgiveness and talking about her, her experience um, in uh, Raffensburg concentration camp. So her, her life from that moment on has had a big impact on me. And I remember uh, hearing in, in another teaching that she gave that she actually had a, a heart uh, condition that required surgery. And the doctor said, if you get this surgery, um, we can probably add about 10 more years to your life. And he said, but if we don't, you'll probably, you'll probably pass away within the next year. And she, as she talked about it, she said, she actually struggled. She's like, wait, I get to go see Jesus soon? Or I could live 10 more years. And like Paul, she chose to get the surgery not because she was scared to die, but because she loved people. And she wanted to continue to minister the gospel and the message of forgiveness that had impacted so many and still impacts so many through her story. Matter of fact, as you have time, you might want to watch, and we have time right now, right? You might want to watch the movie The Hiding Place. Uh, we've watched it several times with our family. It's uh, very inspiring. Or you can read her book, Corrie Ten Boom. And so Paul had this, um, he was, he was, his heart was raptured. His, his mind was consumed with Christ. He, he couldn't stop thinking about this pearl of great price, this knowing of the Lord Jesus, his, his salvation. And he, he, he woke up with it front and center in his mind and it was the great goal, the great motivation of his life. And at times, Paul was intoxicated with Jesus Christ. I'm going to use a parallel passage in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. A good habit of those who study the Bible. If you want to find out what the Bible says, find out what the Bible also says. So that's why we bring in parallel passages. In Ephesians 1, Paul is talking to another church in Ephesus. And he says he's praying for them. And he says, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, 
may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Now, what I'm about to say is one sentence, right? Paul doesn't take a breath. Listen to how intoxicated Paul is with the Lord Jesus. He says, the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. It's like the orchestra is, is entering a crescendo. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his, at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <gasps> Paul is just drunk with love for Christ, passion for the Lord. And it came out in his writings, there's this run-on sentence where he's just worshiping and reflecting and rehearsing the glory of Jesus and the gospel. And so Paul's greatest treasure was Christ. And that's what we see in this text in Philippians 1, that Christ is the pearl of great price for him. It, it, is, it is his greatest joy. It is his greatest treasure. And this gives his heart immense joy even while he is in prison. And the second thing we see in this text, and my last point today, is that Paul wanted the church to have this joy. Paul wanted the church to have this same treasure that he had. What motivated Paul's desire to remain alive in this world while he was in prison was his love for the saints his love for God's people. In a sense, he's saying, I'm remaining alive because I want you to have this joy that I have. I want you to drink this water of life that I'm drinking. I want you to have this bread of life that I have. I want you to know the joy that I have, that the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Listen to what he says in verse 25. My desire is to, to depart and be with Christ. That's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary, he says, on your account. He's saying, so I'm, I'm going to stay alive. It's God's will for me to stay alive. It's for your good. He says, convinced of this, knowing that I will remain and continue with you all, and here it is right here, for your progress and joy. It's for your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Look at the primary expression and motivation of this whole text of scripture okay what is paul saying he has in christ joy what is he saying he wants to give to the church as he continues on in his ministry he wants to give them joy it was burning in paul's heart and it was in every part of his thinking first his own joy in christ and second his motivation to help others discover it. Now, many things motivate people to religion. You know, think about that. A lot of things motivate people to follow God, or at least what they, you know, what they deem to be God or who they deem to be God. Maybe morality, obedience to God's law, being right, the hope of a better world, Fear can motivate people. Pride can motivate people. Community can motivate people. This is, this is my culture. This is my family. This, this is where I have friends. Or this is, you know, I, I found a community here. Now, some of those things may have some merit. But one thing seems to motivate Paul in this text. To follow God. Joy. He found joy in the Lord Jesus. And I appreciate that scripture, Barbara. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's all over scripture, this idea of joy, this idea of God inviting us to himself to experience joy. Now that is a contrast to the way a lot of people think about God. A lot of people think, I can't follow God. I lose control and I lose my joy. And that is the complete opposite of what we see Paul experiencing and Paul teaching. Paul was motivated by joy. He found joy in Jesus, and this is what motivated his ministry. He wanted others to be joyful. He wanted them to have the unmatched joy that he knew in Christ. Now, for the next 
couple minutes here, I get to sound like John Piper. John Piper, in his book, uh, Desiring God, or uh, The Dangerous Duty of Delight, uh, calls this Christian hedonism. You know what hedonism is, right? It's the approach to the world and life where your primary goal is to get the most pleasure out of life that you can. That's hedonism. And generally, when we use that term, we think of a very sinful life of a person who is narcissistic and myopic and lives for their own pleasures at the, at the cost of relationships and at, you know, to their own destruction. But uh, when John Piper says Christian hedonism, he's basically saying that the same thing that motivates the sinner uh, to go and give themselves over to sinful pleasures actually is the same thing that motivates the believer to follow Christ, and that is the inherent desire all of us have to experience joy. And what John Piper is saying when he uses the term Christian hedonism is, uh, I'm a pleasure seeker. I live for pleasure, but I seek it in God, and I find it in the Lord. And so uh, one of Piper's famous quotes that has uh, been repeated often by the body of Christ over the last several decades is this, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And that it, it is falling short to simply call Christ Lord and Savior. He is those things. And we need to receive him in that way. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. But what Paul would say in this text and what John Piper is arguing is that we need to go farther. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is treasure. And that you are truly his own and you truly grasp the gospel when it is truly good news to your heart and it truly shows you the pearl of great price and it shows you that joy that Paul is speaking of here. Jesus, our Lord. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our treasure. Now, what's the opposite of this kind of thinking? If Jesus is not treasure, well, there's a biblical term for it called idolatry. Idolatry is when you find something else is your treasure other than Christ. It's placing too high a value on created things and too low a value on the Creator. And that's why I think it's true when we say that sin is misguided joy. Right? It's we're seeking joy, but we're seeking it in the wrong thing. It's the wrong kind of hedonism. So because God knows that our greatest joy is Him, He makes it His mission to glorify himself in your life. And this is righteous and holy for him to do that. I mean, if a human did that, we would think that's arrogant. You know, if I made it my mission to glorify myself in your life, that would be strange language to you, and you'd be like, something's wrong with him, right? But God is different than us. God actually deserves the glory. I don't. God does. God is the most glorious person in the universe. And so it's righteous and holy for God to seek to glorify himself where it wouldn't be for me because God is different than I am. He's different than we are. Let me say it this way. Righteousness, or what is right and good, is placing the right value on things. Okay, So flip that. Unrighteousness, that, that's what idolatry is, is unrighteousness or placing the wrong value on things. Right? I place too much of value on money. That's unrighteous. That's, that's idolatry. I place too little of value on God, right? That, that's, that's sinful. Uh, you can do it with anything. You know, I too much value on my reputation or my career or romance or relationship or even putting my family or my job before God and too low a value on God, too high a value on even good things is a form of idolatry. So righteousness is placing the right value on things. Unrighteousness is putting the wrong value on things. Therefore, follow me, track with me here, for God to be righteous, and he is, for God to be righteous, he has to value the most valuable thing in the universe, and what is that? Barbara's 
just posted it right there on, on, on our thread. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. It's that he alone is worthy. So for God to be righteous, he has to value himself and seek as his mission to glorify himself and show you his surpassing value. And that's why he makes it his aim to show his glory to us. In the book of Ezekiel, I remember reading that years ago and struck by how many times God said through the prophet, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, and then you will know that I am the Lord. It actually says it 50 times in the book of Ezekiel. In other words, the great aim of everything God was doing in Israel at the time was to demonstrate his glory, that they would know that he is the Lord. So God's aim is to glorify himself to his people, and he broke through in Paul. Paul saw that glory, and he was intoxicated with his relationship with Christ. It was central to him. Jesus was all satisfying to Paul. Jesus was all sufficient to Paul. And the gospel Paul preached was aimed at restoring the beauty of God in the hearts of his hearers. He knew that if he could do that, if they could see the beauty of Christ, then they would know the joy that he had. That original joy that we see in Adam and Eve, the purpose for which we were created, joy in knowing God, joy in a relationship with God. Adam and Eve had it. The Bible says they walked with God. Adam walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day. There was this closeness, this intimacy, this, this father-son relationship that he had with God. And yet it was broken when? When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, right? Satan came in the form of a serpent and he said, here, eat this. And they said, well, God said, don't do that. And he said, did God say that? He knows that if you eat of this, you'll be like him. What was the temptation? Lower your value of God raise your value of this fruit and what you're going to experience through this fruit. It was idolatry. It was the first idol. It was the first, it was a temptation to be satisfied outside of God and to find joy in something else outside of God. And you know what? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because that's what the entire human race has been doing ever since because sin entered the world in that moment. So the nature to attempt to find joy outside of God and to be satisfied outside of God has been our Inertia as a human race ever since. It's been our nature, our tendency. From birth, we seek satisfaction outside of our relationship with God. And so God came to us through Christ and he brings us back to himself so that we might know the joy of his glory like Paul knew. We might find that pearl of great price. So here, here's what we see and here's the, here's the uh, dynamic of this. God's glory and our good soar together. They're the same thing. For God to glorify himself in you is your good. They're the, they're the same path. God glorifying himself in your life is on the same path as your joy. And so that's why God makes it his mission to glorify himself in our lives. And how does he do that? Well, through his word, through the life, uh, death, and resurrection of his son, through his church, and through our sufferings, right? When we experience loss, when our idol lets us down, right? When trials turn against us, when people turn against us, what does that do? What's the effect of that? It moves us back to God. That's why people often, when they're in trouble, turn to God, right? God uses our troubles, he uses our trials, he uses the coronavirus, he uses social distancing, he uses economic, uh, financial strain and pressure and the, the isolation, the, you know, the, the, the internal emotional struggles many people are having right now. He will use that thing in us to drive us back to himself and to show us he is enough. He is glorious. He is our father. He is our provider. He is our everything. He is the pearl of great price. So let's behold the beauty of Jesus in Paul's teaching today. It's there, Paul is saying, this, this is what's given me joy. It's, it's, it's the gospel. It's, it's knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. It's, it's faith in the cross and what that brings into our hearts. He's saying, he's saying that in his teaching, 
But let's also behold the beauty of Jesus in Paul's life. He's not just saying it, he's living it. Remember, this is a prison epistle. What does this tell us? Paul was stripped of every earthly pleasure you could have. He's in prison. In another text, to Timothy, he actually asked for his coat. So he's probably cold. That was in actually his second prison stay. But his experience in prison was, uh, was a, an isolated one. It was a cold one. It was stripped of human pleasures. And yet Paul is full of joy in Jesus. His life says, Jesus is enough. So let his teaching and let the demonstration of Paul's life minister the joy of the Lord Jesus to us, the joy of the gospel. I remember a few years ago, everything's a few years ago when you get older, right? It's probably with like, what, 2000? It might have been like 15 years ago. I went to Sudan. And it was, it was a time when the massacre was happening. The radical Muslims were killing Christians and animists and just any non-Christian, basically. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were dying. And I went there to be part of the ceremony of the first graduating class of, um, of a group of Sudanese students from a Bible school that was started by a friend of mine, Michael Howard, an Englishman from uh, uh, Malawi. And so I went to Sudan and... I thought, man, this is going to be rough. These people are going to be, like, really serious. You know, like, they're in a war zone. You know, death surrounds them. Uh, you know, Michael is a pretty tough teacher and, and, and minister. And yet, long story short, when I went to Sudan, in the middle of a war zone, to the first graduating class of this Bible school, I found some of the most joyful people Christians, joyful Christians that I'd ever met in my life. I mean, laughing, just full of joy, laughing and enjoying fellowship with one another and worshiping God with all their hearts. And I was actually a little embarrassed. I was like, what? What is going on here? They don't have this, 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 and, you know, all these amenities we have in America. And, and I realized that they have Christ. They have the pearl of great price. I think it was Elizabeth Elliot who said, sometimes... You don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I know that by degree, many of us are suffering right now with social isolation, with the emotional pressures of that. I know there's mental health issues that people are struggling with a lot now in society because of this, the financial strain and pressure and tragedies that people are going through right now are very, very difficult. But listen to Paul. And listen to our Sudanese brothers and sisters. What are they saying to us? Jesus is all satisfying. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. So during this coronavirus crisis, when we are all stripped of much, let's behold Jesus as our treasure. Jesus our Lord. Jesus our Savior. Jesus our treasure. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time today in your word. We thank you for uh, that you did let Paul live and uh, Lord, that you allowed Paul to write these letters that could encourage us many years later. And, and in some ways, um, the situations that we're facing or the pressures are not a whole lot different, Lord. And, and uh, uh, we can't get beyond the Bible. It's as relevant today as it ever was, even though our our, our, our trials take a different shape. We are all in a world, Lord, where you said you will have much trouble, but we thank you that you said fear not because I've overcome the world. So help us, Lord, today to enjoy uh, the joy, to know the joy of our salvation and to uh, that our hearts would be taken up with it. Lord, not just in our minds, but your Holy Spirit would help us to feel it, that we feel true joy in the Lord, true gratitude, true life, true peace. Bless my brothers and sisters watching today with that by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks all for watching. Uh, this will be posted uh, on Facebook if you missed any of it. Uh, but thanks for joining us today. And uh, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. Amen, Denise. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. And to you too, Linda.